Hello everyone, welcome back to Rotor Dynamics 101. Today we are on to the floor of the one of the world's largest exhibitions for motors, coil windings, insulations, and electrical manufacturing, which in short, CWEIME. If you are in the business of building motors, whether it's high speed blowers, compressors, traction motors, or generators, CWIEME is where the supply chain comes to life. From magnets to winders, laminations to balancing machines, this place is a gold mine. So this conference took place in Berlin, Germany. So I flew in from the US to attend. The exhibition hall was divided into five main sections. If you are involved in motor design, You'd naturally want to visit a key supplier for magnets, lamination stacks, coils, insulation materials, shafts, and bearings, since these are the core components of any motor. Let's start with magnets, the heart of any permanent magnet machines. I spoke with several vendors offering high-grade neodymium options, with options for low cogging and high temperature stability. Some even had custom surface treated magnets for corrosion resistance. And as you all know, one significant factor driving the increasing in popularity of permanent magnet machine is the decreasing cost of neodymium iron borne magnets, making them more affordable and widely applicable across many industries. Typically, the magnet manufacturer determines the price primarily based on pH max and intrinsic coercivity. So, what is pH max? Here is the historical evolution of magnet pH max. The pH max is the maximum energy product, which is a crucial parameter that indicates the strength of the permanent magnet material. During the 20th century, the maximum energy product of commercially available magnet materials rose about 50 times. The enhancement in the strength of permanent magnet materials, coupled with reductions in the magnet cost, contributes to the rising popularity of permanent magnet machines. At present, the majority of global magnet material reserves are located in China. In the United States, the primary source is the Mountain Pass Mine in California, near Las Vegas. Let's go back to this figure. The different grades of centered neodymium magnet refers to the strength of the magnet field they produce. These grades are determined by the maximum energy product of the magnet material measured in mega gauss oersted. The N stands for neodymium. The number indicates the maximum energy product. Of course, a higher number indicates greater magnet strengths. Knowing this magnet grade information is beneficial when communicating with the magnet supplier. Also, the residual magnetic flux density, BR, is influenced by the magnet material itself. Residual magnetic flux density, BR, refers to the amount of magnetic flux density that remains in the magnetic material after an external magnetic field has been removed. Neodymium iron-borne tends to have higher residual magnetic flux density, BR, compared to samarium cobalt. Also, the residual magnetic flux density, BR, is significantly affected by the manufacturing process. For example, in the case of the same neodymium iron-borne material, if it's centered, the resulting residual magnetic flux density, BR, tends to be higher compared to the bonded neodymium iron-borne material. So, how is magnet made? Let's look into the sintering process first. The initial step is that the materials are melted in a furnace and are cast into ingots 
which are then pulverized into particles. Coarse particles collected from the process undergo jet milling to be refined into fine particles. These magnet particles are placed in a jig and subjected to a magnetic field while being pressed into a shape, resulting in an anisotropic magnets. The ingots are then heat treated in a sintering furnace, reducing their volume by approximately 50% and doubling their density. After sintering, the magnetic properties are checked. Only those pass inspection proceeds to the machining stage where they are shaped to the required specification. So how are bonded magnets made? The bonded magnets can be created from various magnet materials mixed with different plastic binders. These magnets can be formed through injection molding or compression bondings. Although bonded magnets are cost effective, they have a low residual magnet flux density, BR, than sintered magnets because of the binder material added into them. It is important to note that sintered neodymium iron borne magnets are prone to oxidation and corrosion. Therefore, anti corrosion treatments such as E coating must be applied to their surfaces before use. Lamination stack quality makes or breaks your core loss. I saw offerings from several tier 1 and tier 2 suppliers, some using high-speed stamping, others with laser cutting for prototyping. Key takeaway here is that know your core loss targets and back iron saturation limit. You're looking at the stator, the stationary part of the motor. It's made up of two main components, the lamination stack, which is the metal core, and the winding, made of copper wire wrapped around the stack. Over on the left, you will see a simple illustration showing the lamination stack, winding, and permanent magnet rotor. When current flows through the winding, it creates an electromagnetic field. This field interacts with rotor magnet, attracting or repelling, which depended on the current direction, and that's what's causing the rotor to spin. As you well know, magnetic flux always travels from North Pole to South Pole, and it prefers to pass through a materials like the lamination stack. Using a metal core concentrates the magnetic field and improves energy efficiency. But there's a catch. When magnetic fields move through metal, they generate eddy currents, the small loop of current that can cause unwanted heat. That's where laminated steel sheets come in. Instead of one solid block, we stack thin sheet of metal. These sheets reduce eddy currents and help keep the motor cool and efficient. Now let's talk materials. Most commercial laminations are made from iron-borne silicon alloys. Usually 85% to 95% iron with small amount of borne and silicon. It is important to note that the thickness of each sheet matters. For example, Toyota electric motor use lamination sheet about 0.3 millimeter thick. Thinner lamination means less eddy current loss, but they also cost more and harder to process. The lamination sheets can be joined in several ways. Embossing, welding, or gluing. The glued stacks offer better performance, but at a higher manufacturing cost. So why its thickness so important? Because the eddy current loss increases with the square of the lamination thickness. If the sheet is twice as thick, the loss are four times worse. For high efficiency or high frequency machine, 
we go ultra thin as little as 0.025 millimeter, which is about one mil. These are made from amorphous metals, which are non-crystalline and have a highly disordered atomic structure. Amorphous laminations are mostly used in power transformers, but they are catching attention for high-speed motors too. Because the eddy current loss depends on frequency, and these ultra-thin laminations are ideal for high-speed, high-efficiency applications. So the bottom line is that reducing iron loss by using thinner or more advanced laminations is a great way to boost motor efficiency, but it comes at a cost in terms of materials, manufacturing, and processing times. Winding machines were in full display, from slot insertion to hard pin forming. Automation is definitely getting smarter. And don't overlook copper suppliers. Some booths were showing advanced enameled coating and tight tolerance wires. Dynamic balancing matters, especially when your machine is running at a high speed. I saw a few compact balancing system tailored for small to large rotors and spoke with sales reps about balance grade specs like G2.5 and G1.
can be an iron arm, like this as well. Maybe under the same situation. That is all for today. If you like this video, please subscribe my channel. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next videos.